The Dalai Lama once said that today, more than ever before, life must be characterized by a sense of universal responsibility, not only nation to nation and human to human, but also human to other forms of life. Join me in conversation with some of the world's most creative thinkers to explore the importance of ethics to this responsible decision-making in today's technologically infused world. Artists, entrepreneurs, scientists, journalists, academics, and beyond navigate the gray, the blend of right and wrong, of opportunities and risks on all sides of our most important challenges, whether gene editing, civilian space travel, or artificial intelligence. They also probe the age-old and more ethically black and white behaviors, such as sexual misconduct, human trafficking, and life-threatening inequality. Our guests endeavor to transcend religious, political, national, and ethnic perspectives, but recognize the inevitable biases we all bring. The term ethics can make us uncomfortable. At the Ethics Incubator, we confront the E-word head-on. It may be inconvenient or even unclear, but ethical conundrums underpin almost every headline and affect almost every human choice. With truth under threat and the boundaries of humanity blurring, I believe that ethical decision-making tethers us to our humanity. As always, we welcome your thoughts. Welcome back to the Ethics Incubator. I'm delighted to be joined today by Olivier Nigli, the Director General of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. As you all know, WADA has been a great deal in the news, in particular connected to the recent questions at the Olympics in Beijing. But with Olivier, we're also going to get into much broader questions about what types of substances should be banned, for example, caffeine and marijuana, how we educate children around the world, and in particular in countries where there are so many priorities beyond anti-doping in sports, what the consequences are for public health, and what we really should be thinking about when we set limits on athletic events and on how athletes and their entourages behave. So welcome, Olivier. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much for joining the Ethics Incubator today. If we may, could we start and ground the conversation for those who are not familiar with WADA in WADA's mission and just how it is you go about achieving the kind of harmonization of standards and the global impact that you've had? WADA, to put it simply, is the global regulator for anti-doping worldwide. WADA was a born with the idea that the problem of doping is broader than just simply sport and that sport alone cannot tackle it. Therefore, there's the need for public authorities, i.e. the governments and sport, to join in the fight against doping in order to make progress and and try to defeat the problem. And, And that's really the DNA of this organization is these joint efforts which is to bring together the public authorities and sports, each of them having their own responsibilities to work together and to harmonize the fight against doping in order for everybody around the planet to be treated equally. The question of equality comes through, and this question of truth comes through in a lot of your materials. Can you talk a little bit about just how that works? You have a very international board, but how is it that you actually go about assuring that all of these different countries and different sports organizations implement what they need to in order to assure that the standards are being kept. Obviously, this is one of the biggest challenges we have. You have to, to start and understand that when athletes compete against each other, they come from all around the world, but they end up being on the same playing field, on the starting line, on the pitch, wherever they are. And for them, you know, it makes no difference where the opponents are coming from. They just hope that everybody is playing true and playing fair. The challenge for for all of us is to ensure that everybody is part of a system that would guarantee to the others that whenever he's he's on the the start line, he's been submitted to a system which guarantee that, or at least secure the fact that he's been uh, tested. And and it's, it's a very challenging thing because 
obviously not every country of the world, not every region of the world are at the same stage of development. Not everybody has the same resources to address that. Not everybody has the same level of education. So you have to factor all these elements and try to for us, at least to identify first, where are the gaps, which is already a challenging work. And once you've done that, and once we've done that, the, the next step is really to try to help those who are in need, those who may not have enough resources, those may be lagging behind, to develop their anti-doping system and to bring it to a higher level. Bearing in mind that priorities are very different from one part of the world to another. When you have difficulties feeding your population, obviously anti-doping is not on the top of your list. I tend to think about each ethical issue as its own silo, you know, doping or even just the ethics of sport. But in fact, it is interconnected with all of the other ethically written challenges that we're facing, the inequality that you mentioned, different stages of development, different access to healthcare. There are a number of points that come up in a lot of my ethics work where people might rightly say, look, that's luxury ethics. I, I don't know how I'm going to feed the children. Nobody has education beyond age eight, if even there. We have other, they're much more important priorities. And, and along those lines, when I, when I look at your website and when others might, uh, the list of banned substances is extremely long. And for somebody like me, I don't really know what most of them are. I recognize that it's the responsibility of coaches and athletes to know what they are. But is there a connection between just how many banned substances there are and fairness? Are they all sort of equally important? Or are we at a point where athletes' lives are very difficult, coaches' lives are very difficult, and even with the best intentions, and even with the best equipment, it might be difficult to, to comply? It's a very good question. And, and I think that the response to that is, is, is full of nuances. You've got to start, first of all, I think, to, by making a big, important distinction. You have the elite sport. You know, you talk about going to the Olympics. That's the top of the sport. For the elite sport, I would say the athletes are part of a system at that level, which is basically organized by the sports, by the International Sports Federation. And it's not anymore each government who has to have a system. The, the sports organize it worldwide in an harmonized fashion. And at that level, I would say they get medical care and so on. So they are a little bit outside of the constraint that you may have in, a, in the less privileged country versus a more privileged country because they're part of this international system. This being said, there's still differences. We have to accept that. But when you get to that level, you're very high. Now, if you take away the Olympics and you talk about sports as an all it represents for the youth, then you have huge differences from, from one country to another. And as you say, the list is complex. The anti-doping system is complex. If you don't have the appropriate education, if the parents don't have the education, if the coaches don't have the it, it could be very hard for, for, for athletes to find their way through that. Now, the answer to that is not so much to deal with the list because the list of substances is, is done from a scientific perspective, if you want. And, and I think it's a, a consensus among scientists that these substances actually could improve performance or, you know, have, have a, could be bad for the health and so on. But what needs to be done and what we've tried to do is to have a little bit of flexibility in the system. Therefore, while you may be taking a banned substance, there are circumstances that could be taken into account in how this will reflect on you in terms of punishment, in terms of ban, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are some, not too much, because you have to keep harmonization. So the, dif the difficulty is always the balance between having a harmonized system so that Everybody is be treating equally, but also taking into account that there are differences in terms of education, knowledge, and so on, so that you can bring some of these elements when there is a case. But it's, it's not easy. Add to that, I would say, for us, really, one of the goals is to try to avoid cases. To avoid having to make these judgment yeah, calls. Exactly. And, and the repression part, you know, these, these cases that we often make the headlines of the newspaper... This is, to me, the short term. This is, we are policing the society like police does. You know. But the long-term goal is education. And, and education is what will make the difference in, in those regions that are maybe less privileged. Where it, That's where the effort needs to be put. Because 
we realize, you know, when we go to international sports events at lower level than the games, where you bring athletes from, I would say, one or two level below the top elite, then you realize how difficult it is for those athletes if they are confronted with, and with doping by, by a coach, for example, suggesting to them to take the blue pills or the red pills or whatever, you know, they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the tools to say no or to make their own decision or to make the right decision. And to us, that's frankly for the future is the key is to try to instill the right values as early as possible in society. And, and it's a huge, uh, it's a huge job. It's a long-term job. So there's so much interesting in what you said. I mean, I think it's very important for everybody to understand that, as you said, and as, as honestly, I didn't understand until this conversation that when you are at an Olympic level, you are no longer dependent on your government. There are resources and there, there's infrastructure in place, which also means, by the way, that there's a lot of responsibility on that infrastructure, on the International Olympic Committee, etc. But if we can continue what you started to say about education and reaching people younger and younger, I was really struck by the fact that one of your videos talks about the fact that WADA's mission is to reach the youngest child all the way up to the Olympic star. And can you talk a little bit about how you hope to have an impact on younger children who might not even be thinking about uh, athletics at the level of being the Olympic star? And I'll give you an example of why I asked the question. In my ethics work, um, around the time that the Lance Armstrong scandal happened, I was focusing in particular on contagion of unethical behavior. And I was walking down the street in Palo Alto, California, and the 11-year-old son of a friend of mine, um, I ran into him. And we started talking about that because he's a, he was a student soccer player. And he said to me sort of respectfully, Susan, what's the problem? Everybody's doing it, meaning everybody's doping. This was an 11-year-old in the U.S. system, what would be maybe seventh grade, middle school. And in his mind, already in his world of just middle school soccer, not to mention swimming in some of the other sports, quote unquote, everybody was doing it. So I'm interested both in, in how you hope to reach younger children who are not yet at the phase of, of the big dream. And then if we may, I'd like to come on to the, to the recent Olympics and, and the 15-year-old skater. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's a very interesting. First of all, just in a simple way, I mean, that's where you see the, the importance of having both the governments and sports working together in that. Because obviously, uh, the sports federation are dealing with the elite level and they don't have the resources to go down the pyramid because then you... So that's the responsibility of public authorities. Public authorities have a public health responsibility within their countries. And they have also an education responsibility within their school system and so on. And that's where it fits in terms of making sure that you educate the, the youngest properly. Now, why is it so important? As you say, most of these youngest kids will, will never become elite athletes. That's not the idea. The idea is that we live in a society which is desperate for values mm -hmm. and for having the right values. And so sports is one tool that really can bring the youngster the right value that the society needs. I mean, that's the way you have to look at it. Through sports, you can educate the youth for value that will help the society in all, all fields, not just sports, but, but in how they will behave when they're grown up and so on, respect, fair play, honesty, et cetera, et cetera. This is so important. We have been pushing and pushing and will keep pushing the public authorities to ensure that they try to at least do that as part of the school curriculum. And frankly, it's been, to me, it's been a, a very surprising thing that we got a lot of resistance to that. And uh, why is that? What is the resistance there? It's hard to say, but the, the common answer we get often is that all the, the school programs are so full, teaching into that is difficult, this is not sport, this is education, so you talk to the sports minister, but you need to talk to the education minister, etc., etc. Some countries have, have done it. In Japan, for example, they've introduced anti-doping, but more than anti-doping, you know, the values of sports, the values of what does sports bring to the younger. And you do that as part of the physical education course that you normally every kid gets, and you do a few hours every every month or, or something like at least because they need they need to hear it you know they need to understand what it is and they need to to have the the, the knowledge that if one day 
they get confronted with the problem, they can make their own decision. So it's the values, but it's also warning them about the risk for their health. I love what you just said about so they can make their own decisions. Because this whole question of values with young people is really about not just can you list things, can you say equality and fairness and truth, but what happens when you actually have to apply those values mm -hmm. to a real life situation? You just mentioned health. We also have mental health and we're seeing all over the place epidemics of young people with mental health issues, some connected to social media, some not. But we're also seeing recently so many high profile athletes coming forward mm -hmm. uh, and talking about mental health. And it seems to me that these are intricately wound up and bound up. It's how are you going to deal with pressure? Are you going to understand that part of being an athlete is losing sometimes? Are you going to understand that part of being an athlete is saying, I've got to protect my health first and be the best I can be as a healthy person and not push the boundaries. And I'm wondering if, if your whole very important effort also plays into the questions of mental health. I mean, we're not directly dealing with, uh, with mental health in the sense that we're dealing with anti-doping and not with the, the broader health question of, of, of sports and athletes and so on. Of course, we have there's a link and then, then between the two. But, but it's true that for us, I mean, as you say, it's important for athletes to understand why are they in the sport. And, and sport is, is winning, of course, but not winning at any cost. And, and as you say, it's also losing. It's also the friendship you have with the other athlete. It's self-respect. It's learning that you have to self-respect yourself and that by taking something or by cheating or by not being true to yourself, you actually can destroy yourself. Not only by doping, you can destroy yourself in terms of health because you're taking a bad substance, but having to carry the burden of lying to everybody because you're doing something that is wrong. The reputational burden... Yeah. When people are found out, because at the end of the day, as you say, this is science based and it's getting easier and easier to detect. And in fact, you know, I read that WADA has incredible research division that is, you know, in part, if I'm correct, designed to be more and more effective at detecting violations. But before we leave the question of young people, we talked about sort of your average young person. Let's go back to the other end of the spectrum the superstar Olympian, like the Russian skater, who was extraordinary. At 15, there were many commentators who said, you know, at 15, she can't possibly be held responsible because she's being given substances by coaches, by uh, nutritionists, by others around her, by her entourage. Where do you come out on this issue and how that should be dealt with? I will, I will respond to you in general terms because the case is still pending and, and obviously I can't comment on the specifics, but we, in our rules, in the World Anti-Doping Code, which is the legal framework for all of that, we've taken into account the fact that uh, there are young athletes who are getting to the top levels and that should be treated differently. So we have rules for what we call protected people, and it's young athletes, but it also, also be, could be people who have mental health problems or something. There's a definition of protected people. But typically in this case, we certainly agree that the responsibility of a 14 years old is very different than the responsibility of a Lance Armstrong. And that she's not been doing that alone, it's, it's for granted. Now, there is a, an anti-doping component to that, which is how can you mitigate the consequences? What will be the, the requirements for her to prove that she, she did it was a mistake or someone gave it to her and so on. And all this is taken into account into the rules and, and will be looked at in, in, a, in a case like that. There's another responsibility in a case like that, which is the one of sports, not of anti-doping, which is do you need an age limit for young athletes? Because when you put an athlete, a 14 years old, to compete like that in a, in a competition with more senior people, obviously there is also a question of fairness to the others and equality. Because if you treat the mean, minor uh, with a more, lot more lenient rules, but they are competing in the same arena than the other, the other says, well, hey, it's a little too easy for this one because she can claim she, I'm 14 years old, therefore it's not my fault, but she's part of the same competition. So there's also a question for sports to say, well, where do you set the age limit in your sport? And, and, and is it normal to put the pressure on a 14 years old that, that you can have in the Olympics? Is it reasonable? I particularly worry about 
the fact that the age seems to be getting younger and younger. Yeah. And the, the, you know, and the ability to handle the pressure, as you say, I mean, we all know that pressure is something that drives unethical behavior in all kinds of arenas from the business world to sports, to, to science, et cetera. But it is very worrisome to see the kind of pressure that these very young athletes are under. On that topic, I think I'd like to add one thing. It, it shows the importance to have very strict rule on the entourage of the athlete because the abuse on the athletes, whether it's doping or other sort of abuse and can be mental or, or physical, but mental abuse, obviously, the young athlete needs to be more protected than the other. And, and certainly, I think the, the, the rule on, on the entourage is very important. For us in anti-doping, it is uh, a priority to look uh, at the entourage. For example, in a case like the one we just talked about, there's a mandatory provision in our code for an investigation to be conducted on the entourage when you have a case on a, mi on a minor so in this case, for example, an investigation has been launched to try to see who is around her, who, what did they do, uh, what are they responsible for, and it will be a full investigation. Well, that's critically important. I mean, also how she got the substances. Yeah, who told her to do what? I mean, no 15-year-old is going to have access on their own to ban substances in theory. Absolutely. But, and I would add one more thing. This is public information, so I, I can say it. But in this particular case, this young athlete, 14 years old, is taking three different substances for heart. And, and two of them are not prohibited because they, don't, they are not deemed to, to, to meet the criterion of the list. One of them was prohibited and was detected by the lab. But you start wondering why at 14 years old you are taking three of this kind of medicine. And that's the whole question of the entourage. How can you let a 14 years old, maybe if, if she has a heart problem, then maybe there's a question as to whether she should be where she is. And if not, how come you have three of this kind of medicine when you have a 14 years old? So this really raises serious question of also medical ethics. Who is following a girl like that from a medical perspective and is allowing for medication to be given? These are medication for old people. There is a, a true uh, question in terms of how does the medical practice goes with, you know, elite sport. Of course, they are special. They are more extreme in the way they solicit their bodies and so on. But you also have to find the right, the right balance. Can you use medical treatments to, to push the human body to a, an upper limit, is that, is that ethical, frankly? Right. We talked earlier about how the anti-doping ethical questions link up with other areas of society, how developed a country is, resources, etc. This is another way that the ethics of sport links up with other kinds of ethics. In general, I don't believe in ethical silos. And in almost every case, when we look at something, whether it's politics or sports or whatever, it's linked up to other to ethics in other areas of society. And the one you raise is particularly troubling because we as a society need to be able to trust that medical professionals have the best interest, particularly of children at heart. Let me ask you about a couple of specific substances. So the ones on the list have incomprehensible names that people like me don't know what they mean, don't know what they'd be used for, don't have any idea where I would get them. But there are a few that have been in the news lately that are much more commonplace and indeed that are legal. So if we can talk about marijuana, there was the Shakari Richardson case, mm -hmm. um, legal in Oregon. She wasn't an abuser. She used it one time, at least the one time that was in that story. But what is your view on that? And is that something is is that something that WADA is going to take another look at? This um particular substance has been on discussion for many, many years. And it's a, it's a very tricky one. First of all, we can start from the legal, illegal part of it. I mean, it's legal in some part of the world. It's very illegal in some other part of the world. If you go to Japan, we're just coming back out of the Tokyo games, uh, marijuana is, is a criminal offense. You cannot assume that the perception of the substance is going to be the same all around the world, just to put things into perspective a little bit. But for us, and that's where, you know, our work has to be based on science. We have to look at whether or not it meets the criterion to, to, to be on the, on the prohibited list. And, and these criterions are, does it risk to damage the health? Is it contrary to the spirit of sport or does it enhance performance? If it meets two of the three criterion, it makes its way into the list. And for marijuana, we have a lot of 
experts, and, and some of the most prominent ones are in the US actually, who are pretty adamant that there is a health effect from the consumption of marijuana. It's not, it's not an innocent substance. It, it was for many years uh, discussed whether it should be on the list, out of the list. By the way, at the time when we had this discussion a long time ago, the governments were adamant to keep it on the list because they thought it would give the wrong message to the youth if, you know, they would have this anti-drug program within the country. And then the sports would say, oh, it's off the list, so it doesn't it mean it's not so serious. And then how do you reconcile the, the national policy with the, the message from sports? Things since then have moved and, and tolerance to the substance has changed. But it remains that this is a substance that is controversial. For us, what we don't want, I tell you, we want to make sure that we base our decision on science. And therefore, to answer your question, yes, we will. We always have these things under review. And, and for Marana, we'll look at you know, further research, further studies. Is there a, a new approach to the health component of Marana and so on? So this will be looked at. The other thing we don't want is to catch people who use marijuana for recreational purposes that is unrelated to sports because we're not there to punish societal behavior. We're here to deal with sport. That's our mandate. We have already changed the rule on marijuana some years ago to raise the threshold of detection. And I'm going to explain that. When the lab do an analysis, we tell them at which level or from which level on they need to report that they have found the substance. So for marijuana, we lift the threshold quite high, and the cases that are now reported by labs are only high level. I mean, this is not the occasional user that would have used it, you know, five days ago and then get caught at net competition. And yeah. how do you reconcile that with this, this criterion about the spirit? Is it that you, if you don't use marijuana as a performance enhancer, you're okay with respect to the spirit? Or is it just generally the use of marijuana violates the spirit of sport? Again, it's an interesting question. With It's not a black and white. But I give you a few examples to illustrate things. When we had discussion about marijuana, we had, for example, I remember at the time, the Ski Federation and Snowboard Federation. And they said, for us, it's terrible because we have all these snowboarders they come down the slope and the first thing they do when they arrive down there, they, they start, you know, smoking marijuana. And what message does it give to the youth? We, we think it's, it's terrible for the image of the sport. On top of that, the heavy use, and that's where we go to the threshold, there's a health component, which also make it there. And to finish with that, in some sports, not all sports, but in some sports, there's a performance enhancement. And I give you two examples. We go back to skiing, for example. Ski jumper. Apparently, you know, you get a bit more relaxed about jumping from a, such a high things. Maybe after, if, if you smoke a little bit. Tremor, when you shoot, you know, shooting sports or archery and so on. This can take away the tremor. It's a bit the same like alcohol in, in some of these sports. So there may be some sport specific where the performance enhancing in there. I would say in most sports, probably not a performance enhancement. Then it's it's left with spirit of sports and health component. But the, the important element, I would say, in the debate and in the discussion from the scientists has been the health component and, and the view by a consensus of scientists that there is health consequences to a, a heavy use of marijuana. And I think what you say is so interesting. We're looking at whether the tennis player, you know, Djokovic, how he eats we're looking at whether or not football players are willing to get a COVID vaccine. So I, I think, you're, you know, the spirit of the sport and the, certainly the impact is really interesting. Let me just ask you about one last substance that I saw on your website that caffeine is being monitored. And I find that fascinating because caffeine at extreme levels, one could imagine, could have an impact. However, caffeine is in everything from protein bars to just uh, the average soft drink. So yeah. what, is, what is your thinking about caffeine? Caffeine actually was on the list uh, for a period of time in the past. And, and oh, I didn't take, know that. Yeah, and was taken off the list. And, and obviously, uh, th there's one reason for that, and I'll tell you. I mean, first of all, we're not talking about having five espresso before going on, on, on the race, okay? Because that's, that's not the level we're talking about. Caffeine was taken in pills by those who were doing it okay. and, and therefore had much higher levels. The reason it was taken off the list actually was that because at a certain level, it becomes counterproductive in terms of how it helps you. It's a stimulant, that's clear, but it has also a lot of side effects, which we don't think, you know, would benefit an athlete. And there are much better stimulants 
in terms of enhancing your performance and taking caffeine. But we still want to see, and that's why we have this monitoring list. You know, our monitoring list is, is actually not something which is reported by the labs with name of athletes. So we don't know who does what. It's completely anonymous. But we want to make sure we don't miss a trend that suddenly would start. And if we suddenly see something, we want to try to understand what's going on. And it's happened with many different substances because suddenly in one sport, you would see a big use of a, of a substance. And so we need to be always alert and try to understand. Caffeine is there to, to monitor. It could be one thing that is being done in, in doping cases is that substances are not used in isolation. They're used in combination with others. So what we are monitoring too is that is caffeine suddenly would start being used with something else, which could bring a, an interesting cocktail and that would be different. So that's the kind of thing we, we are monitoring. But it's not... It's not our biggest worry, I would say. But I, I really think it's, it's fascinating what you're saying about trends, because particularly in today's world with social media, trends spread not just across a particular sport, but again, to high school students, to children. Everybody has access to social media and people hear of things. And I mean, we saw that, for example, even with COVID, where there's, you know, somebody decides there's some crazy remedy that is absolutely not science based. Yeah. And all of a sudden, very significant numbers yeah. of people are actually not just curiously reading about it, but they're actually taking it. So I think particularly in today's world, your, your emphasis on trends is really interesting. The, the supplement industry is a huge business. A lot of these supplements probably doesn't bring much to the, the individual who takes it, but it's, it's, it's the impression that it's going to do good or it's going to help you. And a lot of trends comes from, you know, oh, you should use this supplement because it's going to help you doing this or doing that. And sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's dangerous. In many cases, the good scenario is that it does absolutely nothing. Yeah. But for example, with elderly people who, as you said earlier, might be taking heart medication, might be taking medication for other things, they have no idea how the mix of what seems like just vitamins might do in combination with really important prescription medications they're taking. You've raised a lot of challenges and, and WADA is doing an incredibly impressive job in continuing to educate and continuing to expand the reach. But if you had a magic wand and you could make one thing happen instantaneously to deliver on your mission more effectively, what would that be? For me, the, the magic thing would be to be able to spread education at a bigger scale. I, I, I believe, not just in Antutuk, I believe that society at large needs more education for many of the things we see nowadays in society. And therefore, for us, I think if we had more resources, for example, I think we would do a lot more education in, in all around the world, in particular in some part where, where this is lacking. That could make a huge difference 10, 15 years down the road. And just in terms of your own journey, you've had a very interesting career journey, but how did you come to the point where you know what your own sort of true north is? I mean, do you have, what are your own core ethical principles? I consider myself to have the privilege of, of working on something that I believe can make a difference for society, for the youth, and so on. And, and that in itself is, is a great motivation. And I think it's a great motivation for most people who work in, in that field. What I've learned over, over the years is that you got to be determined, but you got to be pragmatic. What I've learned is that this is not... The, the world we live in is, is complicated. Uh, the views are very different from one part of the world to the other. And so you, if you are too dogmatic... You cannot achieve anything. I think you're better off being pragmatic. Sometimes you can't achieve everything you want, but at least you get something done. I think my north is, well, let's, let's get on with it. And step by step, let's, let's do things and, and improve things. There's politics. There's many things. You can't do everything overnight, but I think every day is worth doing a little more. I think that's incredibly great wisdom. And on that, I just want to thank you so much again. This has been a really interesting conversation. I've learned so much and I really appreciate you taking the time for this. Suzanne, it was a great pleasure. Thank you very much.